Megan Delacamina. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Leonie. I'm excited to be here. I don't think you know this. Well, you wouldn't know this, but I was so incredibly thrilled to speak to you in particular, not because you're a guru and doing all these, uh, you know, produced all these amazing books and impacting so many women across the globe, but actually the your first book, Getting Real About Having It All, was my very first self-development style book that, yeah, I ever read. Oh, my and gosh. It really impacted me hugely. So thank you so much for taking the time to write that book <laughs> oh that's so kind of you to say that's amazing you just made my day that was like 12 years ago <laughs> right wow. and, my, sister, and yeah. my two sisters there um I've got two sisters one's six years younger than me one seven we all read it at, at the same time and that we were all interrogating each other with the questions that you had when we were away on a family holiday and it was just it literally was a game changer so when I told my sisters I was speaking wow. to you as well they were like oh my god <laughs> It's like speaking to Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. I love yeah. that so much. Yeah. You'll all no. have to read Women Rising now together and compare notes yeah, with each other. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, I absolutely yeah. loved your book and we'll definitely get into that. I, what I would love to um, do first and foremost is introduce for, for those listening who don't know Megan, let me tell you a bit about her marvellousness. So she is a mother and an award-winning expert in women's leadership and, and empowerment with a notable career spanning two decades as a corporate executive and over a decade as a successful entrepreneur. And as the founder and CEO of Women Rising, Megan leverages her vast experience to help women achieve clarity, build confidence and become authentic leaders and her latest book which we'll delve into women rising the forces that hold us back and the tools to help us rise has been hailed life-changing and is a number one bestseller on amazon i feel like i can now take a breath with like what a bio <laughs> you've been a little bit busy <laughs> over the time i mean gosh it is quite impressive <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I need to lie down, I think, after listening to that and take a take a nap. <laughs> right. And I it's, like, a, it's a I, long time though, right? So, yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean, I just yeah, I have so much respect for anyone who is out there trying to make change in this world. And and certainly the your latest book, and look, to be fair, all of your books, I mean, you can see how even from um, you know, way back when when I read Getting Real About Having It All, how much it changed my life. But it's just so beautiful to see how many lives you're impacting over this journey. And what I want to do is obviously as a parenting podcast, I would love to start with your parenting journey before we delve into the book and um a lot of the themes in that. So what I would love to know is, because you are such a go-getter, when you found out that you were pregnant, did you freak out? And what did that look like for you? Because I can only imagine you're like, you know, trying to calculate in your head how all of this is going to work around a really, you know, passionate and um, demanding career as well. Completely freaked out completely freaked out and not only did I freak out but everyone around me other than my parents freaked out and I remember and I've written about it in the book so clearly on my 30th birthday and I'd known I was pregnant for a little while but I hadn't told anybody and I was at brunch with a really small group of girlfriends and I remember saying guess what I got for my birthday and they're all like oh my god what and I said a baby and I remember them all just looking at me blankly and then one of my colleagues who was a close friend looking at me with this look of panic on her face and saying, because no one had babies, right, and saying, but what about your career? And it was this moment of, oh, shoot, what's going to happen next, right? So, yeah, like it was, it was, we wanted to have a baby, but the timing, you know, was a bit of a um, surprise and yeah, complete panic, complete panic. And then 18 months later I got divorced. So then I was a single parent with this career and trying to do all the things and yeah. So it's been a journey. He's, he's 24 next month. Wow. So yeah, yeah. Wow. it's been a long journey long journey <laughs> and so what was your you know what was your first gut instinct around okay 
I'm having this baby, but my career is not going to end because I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and ensure that I can kick on with it. Like what, what were the first things that came to mind for you? Well, when I was pregnant, I mean, the day I, the day I found out I was pregnant, we thought there was a problem with the, the, they were worried it was an ectomic, ectopic pregnancy. So like the whole start of it was stressful. And then Mm. I had a high risk pregnancy. Um, so, and that's a whole nother story. So like there was a lot of stress just around being pregnant, Mm. let alone then managing, you know, managing the career perspective. My Mm. strategy at work was hide it for as long as, as, for as long as possible, Mm. which 24 years ago, um, you know, sounds normal, but even to this day, I hear from, you know, I support thousands and thousands of women, even to this day, that is the very common story that I hear for women at work. How long can I keep it hidden Mm -hmm. until I can't anymore because of the impacts that it could possibly have on my career? Um, I uh, had Luca took six months off, came back to work and then worked part-time like three and a half days a week for that first six months. And then I was back full-time after that. Mm. Did Mm. you feel it was too soon looking back now what would your advice and guidance be to someone listening who is like you and is really into their career and really motivated and passionate Mm. but also looking to juggle you know a newborn look I think it's there is no rule you know um if if I had have had my look it's it's so hard to say right because Knowing what I know now, would I have taken 12 months off and had, you know, more sort of grace and space in the journey? Maybe. But I think for women who also really love their work, then six months, like six months for me felt like the right amount of time. Like Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was ready to go back. I did a couple of days a week at home. I had support with my mother and my then mother-in-law. Like that, that, that time felt okay for me. But for some women, it's going to feel too long. For other women, it's going to feel way too short. Like I think the most important thing for women is tune in and understand what is right for you in all of the aspects of becoming a mother Mm -hmm. or being a mother if you've got older children. And then how do you honour that? How do you choose for yourself and then honour that choice because so often as women we're just constantly pulled, right, Mm -hmm. and we're constantly trying to fit into other people's expectations and Mm -hmm. society's expectations of who we should be, how we should mother, how we should work, how we should do those things together, Mm -hmm. and it can really set us up for, like, just this impossible race that we're never going to finish. Yeah, couldn't agree more because I know even for myself, um, I love my job. I love what I do and all my passions and businesses. And uh, me working was a bit of a break. That was, I I was able to sort of hit equilibrium a little bit and then tap back into family life. And I speak to a lot of parents, particularly, you know, mothers who, who do feel that way as well. So you're right. There is no right or wrong. It's just the mad balance of parenthood that we all experience. I, through the podcast, speak to a lot of couples it is sort of our point of difference Mm -hmm. here on parenthood um and we talk tend to talk about a lot of the challenges that creep up in our relationships and i'm curious i I always love to sort of ask our single parents too perhaps looking back what were some lessons or what were some things that you noticed in your relationship i know it was obviously um many years ago now but now looking back on it um that sort of made you hit the point where you're like, you know what, it feels right that we sort of part ways and we we kick on with life separately. Were were there things that come to mind that might be helpful for others to hear as well? Yeah, that's such a good question. I've never talked about this publicly, by the way, like I've never talked about it. So, Mm. um, so that's, so that's really interesting. Um, Look, I think when you, We were together for for quite a long time, like from when I was quite young Mm -hmm. and in some ways grew together and in other ways didn't grow together. And I think that's really challenging for people Mm -hmm. and spent a long time working out, were we going to be together, were we not going to be together? Um, Of course, incredibly challenging when you have a, you know, a a new little, you know, being to, to take care of. But I think for us ultimately when 
you know you're going to be happier apart than you are together, when you know that you're going to thrive more on different paths, and when that's going to be better for the, you know, we always say stay together for the children, but a lot, you know, like a lot of the times it's the very worst thing that you can do if if the parents are really unhappy or if it's, you know, you know, like if you're arguing and, and all of those things. Um, so that was that was what it was for us. And for us, it was the right decision. You know, he, he, he's, he was and is a great, a great man, went on to remarry and, you know, has had a fabulous life and I've gone on to do my things mm-hmm. and, our you know, our son thrived, you know, mm-hmm. the whole way through. So because we co-parented and, and, you know, that blended extended family was really important for us and we cultivated that really closely still to this day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just think you have to follow what you really do believe to be true that is the right mm. path even though i think that path was the harder path than staying together for sure for sure and how did you feel because this is another topic that often comes up when your partner or your ex sort of does meet someone and all of a sudden your child is now spending time with you know them too it, <laughs> Is it, a, is it a lot of complex emotions when that came up for you? Was it a process to get used to? Do you remember? Like, And, again, I'm asking those who perhaps might be listening who are sitting in that right now going, look, we're trying to co-parent yes. in the best way we can, but I'm just really resentful at the moment. Yeah. Look, I think you have to honour your feelings and – you know, time, time is a, time is a beautiful thing. So like, where are you on that spectrum? Is it, is it really fresh and raw and how you are going to deal with that? It's going to be very different than if you've been separated for, you know, two years and some of that rawness has sort of settled down. For me, it was always about, you know, is there a values alignment between who's in his life, whoever that is, And if there's values alignment, I'm okay. Like, is he going to be safe and taken care of and looked after and loved and supported? Tick, I'm good. And, you know, I was blessed that 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 was the case Um, in our situation. I think it would have been a very different story emotionally if that wasn't the case and if it was someone coming into his life that I didn't feel was, you know, like meeting all of those things that I felt that I felt like he was safe and loved. Um, so yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole nother, you know, an, another scenario. And then there's some hard conversations that need to take place if that's the situation you're in. But I think we have to, like, we just have to honor our feelings. Like, where am I at with this? Rather than push it down, you know, try and crowd it out with other things that maybe are not healthy for us. Um, and acknowledge and voice. You know, like, this is how I'm feeling about this. This is what I need to see here to feel comfortable with this situation and try as much as you can. And it's incredibly hard, especially when you first split up, to to walk that path together for the sake of the, you know, for the sake of the child or the children. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done. I remember yes. it. Right? Like, you, like, you don't forget those mm-hmm. emotions and and that journey. Yeah. I always have so much respect for single parents. It is not an easy gig. I mean, half the time you think, you know, all the all the things that you need to be done for your beautiful child, you know, that's mm. on you for, a, you know, whatever period of time in the week that you happen to have your child, depending on sort of the arrangement and things like that. How did you feel juggling the, that weight of responsibility alongside, I'm assuming, a, a demanding career at that point in life? T- talk to us a bit about that point in life for you? Yeah, so I was, uh, I mean, I always had big jobs, you know, I always had big, busy jobs. I was always working for, you know, big multinational companies. At the time I was at PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting, uh, in a in an Asia Pacific role. So I was doing a lot of travel mm-hmm. and then ended up at IBM through acquisition. So IBM bought the consulting business of PwC and ended up at IBM. And at that point, I was like, Luke, he would have been like two, 18 months to two. So it was very fresh, like right in the middle of everything. And I remember saying to my boss, 
you have to get me in because they were, you know, working out who's taking which roles in the in the merger. And I said, you have to give me an Australian-based job. Like, I can't travel anymore. I can't. Like, I just spent nearly 10 years on a plane, you know, in and out all over the world. And they were trying to position me for this big Asia-Pacific director's role. And I said, I can't do it. Like, I've got my child. I'm getting divorced. I need to be home. So that was a big sort of decision point. I mean, look, looking back, it really wasn't a decision at all. Like, that's what had to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then just at every stage, like, what's the decision now? And what's the decision now? And how do I make this work? All the way through to when I was 36, he was six, and I completely burned myself out to the point that I walked into my CEO's office and I just said, I'm done. Like, I can't do this for one more second. Because I didn't have any of the tools that I now teach. You know, like this was, you know, 18 years ago. I didn't know how to set boundaries. I didn't know how to tune into what I needed. I didn't know how to set a vision, you know, for our, for my life and for our family life and look after my well-being and manage my career. All of this stuff that I teach now, I didn't have any of it. So I was like really floundering. What, do you remember the moment of burnout? Like, I, do you remember that moment where you're like, as you said, I'm done what was it that pushed you over the edge what was happening for you had you slept had you you know what you know thinking with a child as well it's always interrupted sleep on top of all this work expectation on top of responsibilities like explain to us what that looked like so I had we were working on a big uh big major transformation and I was um I was in New York at, at our corporate head office and just feeling, I'd been feeling for ages. You know, you just, you just don't feel well. You're still going and you might be high functioning as I've always been, but I just didn't feel well. And I was just always stressed, always anxious, always running, never sleeping, doing all of the things. I'm sure many of your listeners will relate to that. And this particular day I had flown in from New York and Um, gone home, had like had some sleep, got up and drove into work. And just that, that weight of exhaustion. And one of the keys of burnout is that you just start to care less. You get that, that like you sit back, you feel more apathetic. You get that emotional distance. You're just not interested anymore. And I was driving into the car park that morning and I called my mum for the pep talk (laughs) to say, like, I just don't think I can do this anymore. Expecting her to say, oh, no, you'll be okay, you'll get some sleep, you'll get over your jet lag, you'll be fine. And she said, of course you can't, Megan, you have, excuse me, she said, of course you can't, Megan, you have no life. And it was just like this perfect moment of clarity of, like, what are you doing you know, you're not well, you have no balance, you have no life, you, you like, it's just all off. It's all out of whack. And I literally got out of my car, got in the lift, went up to my CEO's office, walked into his office. And I said, like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this for one more minute. And he was shocked because what we find for so many women, we hide it so well particularly back then, but even now, like we put on that mask, I'm fine, I'm doing great, everything's good, yeah, power through it. And he had absolutely no idea, uh, which we still find today as well, by the way, for most bosses have no clue what's going on for their people. And, yeah, basically that day I said, I'm not doing this big role anymore, like let's figure something else out. So... Mm. Did at what point was the stage in which women rising came about? Where you well, you essentially decided to start empowering women, coaching, going out on your own, exiting that big corporate machine. Talk us through that journey. Was was it st- mm. still several years down the track? What did it look like for you? Yeah, it was seven years. So it mm. wasn't it wasn't fast. So I gave up <clears throat> gave up my director of marketing role. And because I just felt like we were going through a major global transformation, I was right in the middle of it. I thought there's no way I can do justice to this working less. They just can't do it. Um, 
part of what I had been trying to do for the company was strategy. So they said, okay, let's split these roles. We'll get someone else to backfill you in marketing. You take the director of strategy role. And I did that four days a week and I did that for seven years. So I worked Monday to Thursday. I didn't work on, like actually didn't work on Friday. Not what we find so many women do, which is say, I'm going to work part-time, work full-time, get paid less, Mm -hmm. work the same hours. I didn't do that. Although it was a transition. Um, And then I took on as well, gender diversity. And that was sort of like my, my passion project where I really started to get, um, focused on like, how do women thrive? How do we thrive at work? I went and did my yoga and meditation teacher training. I went and did a second master's degree in wellness and positive psychology a few years later because I wanted to really understand like the science of thriving and the science of womanhood, really, like the spirit of what is that? How do we do this? So the last couple of years of my corporate career, I wrote Getting Real About Having It All. I was getting very involved in women's work, women's leadership, gender diversity, coaching, coaching women, speaking about women, all things women. Mm. And then 11 years ago, I left. So I've had my own business for 11 years and Women Rising um, as a company has been around for, we're in our fourth year now. Talk to us a bit yeah. about Women Rising and then was the book always in the back, the Women Rising book, was it always in the back of your head once the program was established? Like talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, so the program, um, four years it's it's been out. So we call the Women Rising program Holistic Personal and Professional Development. So it's this really beautiful fusion of looking at like your life vision and your purpose, building your confidence, um, getting the building blocks that we really need for career success, focusing on your well-being, and then being involved in leading change. So it's this gorgeous sort of four-month, eight-module virtual journey. Um, And it really is everything that I ever wished I'd had, (laughs) you know, through all all of my ups and downs, which you've now heard some about, plus all of my research and my academic journey, et cetera, and my research into women. So that's the journey. We run that twice a year in March and September. We have women from 63 countries who join that. So it's fully, it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful community experience. And I knew my, my third book came out in 2019, Simple, Soulful, Sacred. And then I paused because I, number one, I was building a startup. So that takes a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. But I also had this sense that there was something big coming around this book but I needed time and space. Like I needed to, we've had nearly 10,000 women in the Women Rising program in four years. That's a lot of women's voices and a lot of input Um, and, you know, just more research and work because I've been trying to get my hands around, like what's missing? There's all the things that we talk about and then there's everything under the surface. And so much of this book is about everything that's under the surface which are the things that keep holding us back as women. And that's why it just took me, I didn't want to contribute to more noise in the space. I wanted to get to the point where this is what I think the breakthrough is and now's the time to do it because we are in this zeitgeist moment around women and work and women's leadership and motherhood. So, yeah, that's why the publisher was like, right, let's go, get it out, (laughs) September. Yeah, it's so true. And I remember at the start of your book, you sort of make mention of, um, you know, there was Lean In, there were these sort of books that were just kind of Mm. very transformational in the way in which we looked at things as a society. And like your book, to some extent, reminded, reminds me of one of those sort of you know, like a lean in, as in it's completely, you know, different angles and context and topics. However, in the yeah. in the aspect, um, in the way in which it seems quite transformative, a lot of these themes that you're bringing up, I was sitting there going, oh, yeah, of 
course, but no one's really spoken about that or articulated it in the way that you did, you know? Um, So uh, look, I'd love for the benefit of our listeners. Can you please, maybe, I know it's, it's a beast of a book, but I mean, a couple of key themes that really, I don't know, you are the most passionate about as well for those listening. um, Yeah. To get a crux of it. Yes. Um, So I think the simplest way to, to share about the book is that it's in three parts. So the first part is the forces that hold us back. So these are what I call the paradoxes of power that women experience in their everyday lives, being women, being mothers if they are, and being workers, but that we don't talk about and that we don't understand how deeply and profoundly they influence our experience of our lives and of our careers um, and of, you know, and of motherhood. And there, you know, there's six core paradoxes that stem from the patriarchy that we all live in that hurts women and hurts men too, by the way, um, and, and limits everybody's potential. And they are the empowerment paradox. You know, we expect women to be empowered in systems that disempower us. The leadership paradox, where we where women get told, we want you to lead, but don't lead like that. Like lead like this, like the way it's always been done, lead like a man. The motherhood paradox, one of the most important ones, which is, you know, we expect women to parent like they don't have jobs outside the home and to work like they don't have children, an impossible situation that we can never win in. Uh, And then there's the confidence paradox, the success paradox, and the visibility paradox. So these paradoxes really articulate for so many women, and this is the feedback that I'm getting, which was my hope that this is the water that we're swimming in. But when we don't recognize it, when we're just the fish who doesn't know what water is, then every time we come up against an obstacle, we think it's just us. We think it's our fault, right? We think that... Sorry. Can you still hear me? I've got you. Okay, fine. Sorry. I just got to think that other thing stopped. Okay, no, all good. <laughs> do you want me to start it again? Sorry, yeah, I know we'll be able to get that we... back. I'm yeah, just doing yeah, new yeah. audio. I'll, I'll okay, pick it up. Cool. Okay. Um, so you were saying we, uh, we think that... When we don't understand, yeah. yeah. When we don't understand that there are all of these forces going on outside of us, then when something happens or we find ourselves in a situation or when things don't go to plan, we think it's our fault. You know, we take all of that responsibility on ourselves when sometimes that's true, but a lot of the times it's the bias in the system or it's the structures or it's things that are happening that we have absolutely no control over. So understanding these paradoxes of power is incredibly important so that we can differentiate what is out there that is influencing the way I experience my life and what's in here, like what's my work to do. And that's part two. So that's the inner critic and really understanding how do we internalise that external patriarchy and what are the stories that we tell ourselves that hold us back? And we all have them. You know, I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not a good mother enough. You know, I have imposter syndrome whatever it is. And what I've distilled in part two is 13 archetypes of the inner critic, things like the perfectionist, the people pleaser, the ideal mother, the empath, so that we can look at those archetypes and really get a handle on these inner critic stories that we have. It's the number one thing that women self-report holds them back are the stories they tell themselves about what they can and can't do. And then what do we do with that? What are the actions that we take? What are the steps? So that's part two. And then part three are the tools, you know, tools to help us rise. So a really practical toolkit of things to build your life vision, get on your purposeful path, build your confidence, um, evolve your career, become an authentic leader and be truly well, like be truly radiantly well. So that's the toolkit that everyone can use to go, well, what do I need? Do I need to get clarity on my life vision? Do I need to evolve my career? Yeah. Do I need to focus on my well-being? 
So that's the journey through the Women Rising book. Does that make oh, sense? Is that it? it is look, that it does. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, 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 what blew my mind was how you were able to put so many of those pieces of the puzzle together mm. and, as I said, articulate it in a way that you're like, everyone else is like, oh, yeah, like that makes sense, yeah. you know, because there is a lot of meat in this book. Um, And even yeah. when I was reading it, I thought to myself, I don't even think this is necessarily just for those who might be, you know, really big into their jobs, call it all, you know, like really, you know, it's for every single person, you know, you know, yeah. every single woman out there who perhaps just wants to be the best version of themselves, wants to feel driven in their own right. You know, you might be a stay-at-home mum but and great all power to you I always say stay-at-home mums I have the hardest job in the world and you know hardest, job in, the world. hardest job in the world and you're sitting there and reading this book and getting the tools so that you can empower yourself and as I said be the best version you know perhaps there's um opportunities to stand out within your community within your friendship groups within your relationships you know so I think that's what was so great for me it it's so adaptable regardless of I guess what you as an individual see success looking like I don't know, was yeah. that sort of the purpose of it as well, Megan? Yes, so well said. Um, like this book, I feel like this book is for every woman who wants to empower herself to create success and live a life of her own making. Like really, that that was the intention of which I, where, how whatever your work looks like, whether you're at home, whether you're at the office, you know, whether you're in your own business, um, that was my intention. So yeah, for every woman and also, by the way, for every man who wants to better understand the lived experience of women and how they can step up as allies, whether that's at home or at work, there's a whole section in the book called what about the men? Like, how do we get the men to help, to help understand what it is like for women and some fascinating, like for your podcast where you do a lot of couples, for them to read the book together and then to have real conversations about, you know, how do we make this better? How do we make this better in our home and in our relationship with this lens and understanding of what the world is like for women, I think is some of the most important work that we can do. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, it's so true. Having the opportunity to have, you know, both people see both sides of the coin, you know, like yeah. the, you will only become, I don't know, even, yeah, a, the, the better version of yourself as you sort of have that empathy and some sort of knowledge as to what is, you know, what other people's experiences could be and how you could perhaps, you know, better theirs and also better your own implicitly. So, yeah, I'd love that. And what would you say, Given all of this, particularly because I often have so many mothers who say to me, uh, as we were mentioning at this sort of coming full circle in our conversation, we were mentioning at the start, oh, my goodness, my identity now that, I, you know, I knew who I was previously uh, before children and now everything shook. And that part of the book uh, what, what, where you beautifully articulate that, you know, we uh, I'm going to butcher this, but parenting as though we have no job and then you're having a job, you know, ha uh, working as yeah. though we have no children. Like that is literally such a mic drop comment. And I think we all, you know, can resonate with that comment to some extent. Um, so I guess my question is any uh, words of advice for those who do feel like they are experiencing some level of a identity crisis um, in the earlier stages of parenting? Is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, look, it's so hard, right? Like I think we have to just acknowledge how hard this is. You are an individual person and now you're a entity, yeah? Like there's multiple things going on here and I think we just expect women to pop out the baby and just like get on with it right with no no idea no discussion no social narrative or support about what's just happened and this evolutionary transformative journey that women have just gone on in bringing a new person into the world right and then having to look after this new person so I think there's that acknowledgement. And then the big thing for me is like honour the season that you're in. 
and let it be fluid. You know, like those first, it's not even months, it's years, like that first five-year period, I think, when we yeah. when we have our kids is, is just so, especially when it's your first, is so unknown. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what's expected. We're trying to survive. We're trying to keep them alive. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like in, in all of the ways. Mm -hmm. It is so challenging so, uh, you know, I would love women to lower their expectations for themselves, not in terms of what they want for their life, but in terms of not giving yourself 50 bars to have to jump over every day and not feeling like you have to understand at this particular moment in time, what is the rest of my life going to look like? What is my career going to look like? Who even am I now that I'm a mother or that I'm a mother of three instead of a mother of two? And give ourselves some grace and some self-compassion to let it unfold because, you know, we, we we get pregnant, we have a baby, and then we expect to just, you know, pick up where we left off. And it's not that. It's a heroine's journey that, we've, that we're going on. And we, we get to honour that. And we need people to support that journey as an evolution, not just as a, okay, well, you were here, you were here. Okay. Like what's wrong with you? Get on with it. It's not that. <laughs> yeah. And for women to honor that for ourselves and for us as women to honor that for all other women is an incredibly important part of this conversation. Do you feel from your book, is there, you know, a great intention to obviously impact so many of us in a way that could potentially shift the way in which we are you know viewing society norms in a way I mean I know that's probably a massively grand objective but fundamentally I feel like that's where the book's heading was that the goal really from your perspective yeah that's the goal yeah that's the goal somebody who read it posted on LinkedIn last week and they said someone I don't know said this feels this book feels less like a read and more like a revolution mm -hmm. yeah and I just, like, I caught my breath because that's absolutely my goal. Like, my goal is, number one, that all women read this book and get empowered for themselves, for their own journey, for their own yeah. happiness, for their own success, whatever that looks like for them. That's yeah. absolutely goal number one. Goal number two is men get this book and read it and start to really understand what it is like to be a woman in this world. And whether that's their wives, their daughters, their team members, their peers at work, um, because when I talk about these things with men, they have an awakening and they're different because of it and then everything else changes. And then we've created um, some resources like a Women Rising Circle Guide and I would love, like I have this dream of women coming together in circles like like a book club, like a women's circle, like with our guide and talking about these things because like we don't uh, sometimes, like sometimes we may be blessed and we've got one person, you know, we've got our best friend or that one person we can have conversations with. But I find that for a lot of women they say, you know, like I never talk about confidence or my confidence issues with my girlfriends. Like I never really talk about my well-being or I don't talk about the challenges that I'm having here at work or at home. And to use this book and the guide that we've created to create a safe space for these circles and discussions because I think that's where the change happens and that's where we get validated. Oh, I thought it was just me. Oh, it's you too. Yep. Yeah, oh, my experience is this, but I, I support you. Yeah. And we start to get this beautiful ripple of change. So that's my dream. And that, that happens for women. It happens in organizations. It happens with male allies so that we can just move the conversation forward. Oh, I love that. You're so, you're very inspirational, Megan. So firstly, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Thank you for Put it, bringing us this revolutionary book that I'm sure now all of our listeners are going to want to get their hands on. Uh, how can people, I mean, is there one location in particular that where, uh, uh, where, I'll start that again. Is there a specific site that is, oh no, say that, I'll say that again. 
where can our audience find the book? Uh, just go to womenrisingbook.com. Super simple. Perfect. All of the information is there and all the places where you can get it. I'll pop those that um, URL in the episode notes as well. Any final words that you would like to leave with our audience, Megan? Look, I would just say honour yourself. Like honour yourself. As a parent, trust yourself. Like you know what's best, really. If you get quiet and tune in, you know what's right. You know what's right for you. You know what's right for your kids. And I would just love all the parents out there to go a little bit more gently with themselves because this is the most important work there is and it is the hardest work there is being a parent. And, yeah, I think everyone could do with a little bit of grace and nurturing. So, yeah, go gently is what I would say. I love that. Thanks so much again, Megan, for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Leonie. Awesome. Thank you.